Coast on the day of the Hall of Fame. I'm Matt Miller. Good morning, Matty. Good morning. Your open reminds me of a recent skit I saw from Jeff Foxworthy yes. where he talks about his wife always asking questions and he got a text, you know, just a simple, hey, pray for Tim, he's in the hospital. And he shares mm-hmm. that with his wife who then asks a myriad of questions and he just keeps repeating. <laughs> all I know is I got a text, pray for Tim, he's in the hospital. But what about yeah. all I know I got a text? So <laughs> Very well played. Bill does that to me a lot, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I get to listen a lot of mornings, uh, getting the dogs out or, you know, driving back and forth from various places. So I hear it. Um, yeah. I know what you have to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill is back tomorrow for the Friday show. Mr. Gilstrap and uh, Mr. Harvey, the uh, uh, usual and uh, typical uh, Thursday co-hosts unavailable today. Uh, and Mr. Miller kindly filling in as the solo Hall of Fame that he is. Appreciate your time, Matty. I didn't expect to be solo, no. so we wish uh, Mr. Gilstrap well as he's a little under the weather. Yeah, well, yeah. As, uh, I guess there's a stomach thing going around. There's there a, is. So be careful out there. Wash, wash your hands. Just <laughs> You can eliminate a lot of problems by washing your hands thoroughly and uh, a few times. Don't be obsessive compulsive about it to the point where you're Do you know how to wash your hands is the key. Um, If you volunteer in the kitchen at the Martinsburg Union Rescue Mission, Mm -hmm. they teach you specifically how you are to wash your hands. And I had never washed my hands like that before until I got there and realized it. Yes, absolutely. You know, how you turn the water on, when you turn it off. Like, don't, you know, you can't turn it off immediately after because you Mm -hmm. have a chance of touching potentially contaminated handles with the hands you just cleaned so mm-hmm. yeah it 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 it, it will uh, teach you how to do it right i've never had that sort of thorough instruction but i do know that my wife sings the happy birthday song when she washes her hands okay. i've actually heard her do it too. okay <laughs> so i should wash until i'm done happy birthday happy birthday yeah, do the happy birthday song and then you're done with your time that you should take to wash your hands dr hardians knows he's a doctor he's, he's trained in this kind yeah, of stuff that, right? i think that's a scientifically proven method <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's been peer-reviewed, tested, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Dr. Jonathan Hartians is our guest here on the program, the Mountaineer Recovery Center and Village. And Dr. Hartians, you have some good news uh, for us. Yeah, I'm really thankful to be here. And, uh, man, what a delight to come in and hear you guys talk. This is my idea of retirement, is to be yes. able to just kind of, and kind of jab. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's a delight to come in here and talk with you about uh, all the things that are happening. And by the way, when you're ready to retire, if you'd like a career in co-hosting, let us know. I'll be sure to do that. I yeah. still got a few years before I get there, but um, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely. So uh, let's uh, let's focus on a couple of things. First and foremost, I want to get out the news that you have a golf tournament coming up to do some fundraising. Yes, we do. We have a golf uh, tournament uh, September 23rd. That's a fr- uh, Monday um, in at the Woods Resort. And it is a fundraiser to buy the furniture that will be used to um, provide the living arrangements in the upcoming Mountaineer Recovery Village. Mm -hmm. Uh, The village will be a large uh, um, housing development that's a a drug-free, sober, uh, alcohol-free environment for people to live after they finish rehabs from any places around the state. Um, or anybody who is in outpatient treatment and needs to get into a better living situation. So we're looking forward to providing uh, that golf tournament as a way to educate the community, have a lot of fun, and raise some money for a good cause. How do you register for it? You can go online to www.simperlee.org. That's S-E-M-P-E-R-L-I, which is short for Simper Libri. Uh, That's the nonprofit that's operating the, um, the housing. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a link there in Sipperly.org to uh, register for the golf tournament or uh, businesses or individuals can sponsor um, maybe in memory of someone or um, in honor of someone or just to represent their business. And you have 48 units that will be online soon. Yeah, you know, the village is, is a real important piece in the overall kind of in the lingo right now, what's called the recovery ecosystem. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, when the opioid epidemic was really um, just knocking everybody down, the uh, state as a whole um, just didn't have many resources put in place. And so over the last 10 years, I would say, DHHR has done a really good job and put in a lot of effort to providing more treatment resources uh, for this epidemic. And uh, they've put in putting in efforts in initiative with initiatives towards prevention, towards education, towards treatment, 
And, uh, and then a missing piece has been the housing. And so many people who get caught up in addiction lose everything. And when they're trying to rebuild their lives back um, with a clean and sober lifestyle, they just don't have a place to land. So they may come to treatment and get clean and sober. They get the tools to stay clean and sober. But more often than not, they go back to the same environment they came from. And so, you know, you, you take someone who's struggling with addiction and you put them back in the same neighborhood or in the same household where drugs and alcohol are, and it's just a recipe for relapse. So the Recovery Village is an opportunity for people to come that'll be in a community where people share the same values of sobriety and um, have support services around them. Uh, the village will be providing transportation to work. Uh, and that's going to be a big asset. A lot of people lose their license. They get a DUI or um, have something legally that prohi prohibits them from driving. And they can't get back and forth to work, which means they don't have the income to afford housing. Uh, so they're kind of in a hole they can't get out of. So the village is to help them with providing housing that they'll be paying for. We'll be taking them to work. They get their paychecks. And then they'll be paying for the housing services they'll receive there in the village. So as you spoke, uh, yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start out with 48 um, beds for, for residents there within the village. And then um, as we get that started and we can apply for more grant funds, our goal is to um, have some progressive housing, where meaning that it'll get to where people can eventually progress to have their families and have three-bedroom townhomes uh, for up to 200 people. Mm -hmm. So that's the vision that's for, exciting. The for the village. And you have an open house coming up. We do have an open house. So the construction is in progress. And uh, we wanted to get the community excited about the progress that's been made. And so our board just thought it would be nice to have an open house for the community. That's tomorrow from 11 to 2. Uh, just drop in. Uh, you can take a tour of the house as it's under construction and uh, see the floor plan and the layout, um, the design. And, um, and then from 12 to 1230, we'll have a brief um, uh, overview um, presentation. Uh, some people who have been contributors to the village will have a chance to be recognized and speak. And then um, we'll continue the open house until 2 o'clock. And where is the location? So the village is located um, right on the Berkeley-Jefferson border um, off Route 94 Lane at Short Road Exit. It's off of Van Meter Road um, right next to Pleasant View Cemetery, um, but it's off the Van Meter Road um, between um, Route 9, the old Route 9 uh, by Pleasant View and Short Road. So 544 Van Meter Road is the address. Matty. Uh, Dr. Hardings, take us back to kind of the beginning of the Mountaineer Recovery Center and then the progress to reach this point of seeing the village constructed and, and adding that element that you mentioned earlier seemed to be missing in the process. Yeah, that's an that's a excellent point because that was, that was really an evolution of our uh, realization and, and development of this concept was that um, we opened up the Mountaineer Recovery Center in 2019 and um, you know there was nothing in the community nothing in the panhandle for a residential treatment um, everybody would either have to go out of state or go way down south and the problem that you run into when you go to treatment elsewhere is it's I should say it's easier to get clean and sober when you leave and you go to an environment far away and you're kind of like on vacation and there's not as many temptations. But then when you come back, it's harder to generalize those tools or skills that you learned. And so it's important um, for the sake of that and also to have family integrated into treatment, to have treatment in the community. So opening up Mountain Air Recovery Center uh, through some grant funds that DHHR provided from the state in 2019 was a, a big deal. And uh, we opened that in um, November. And then, as we all know, COVID hit right after that. Um, but the staff there and team was amazing. No, but we didn't shut down. We didn't change any operations. Everything continued because obviously um, addiction doesn't stop by, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we continue with that. But one of the things we noticed as we graduated about 450 people a year was that we would start to see people come back. And um, they had had good efforts, had good intentions. Um, they had good tools. But uh, when we'd investigate, all right, what went wrong? Uh, why did the relapse happen? 
for many of them, it was because they went back to the same environment they came from. And, um, you know, that's just not realistic for any of us about trying to change any behavior. If I'm trying to lose weight and um, watch my diet, it doesn't help if I'm sitting around a, uh, a bunch of ice cream and Snickers bars. So, uh, Making me hungry, Doc. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it just doesn't work. So you got to have a change of environment. And, um, and so we started thinking about what, what could we do to accommodate that? Um, well, in tw- late 2020, uh, we were really blessed with um, the WISH Foundation. And, and um, uh, the WISH is uh, uh, Women Investing in Shepherd. It's a women's philanthropic organization, part of Shepherd, uh, mostly all Shepherd alum. And um, they were uh, offering grant funds, and we applied for some, and they gave a $20,000 uh, seed money. And we used that money to buy um, a, a home. We used that as a down payment on a home that was known as the, became known as the Ashley House. Um, it housed six women, and we had a house manager oversee the house. And um, women who would graduate from the recovery center could move in there and we were amazed at the results, the stability that the women had, the accountability, the support. Um, we, they didn't have near the relapse rate. We didn't have anybody um, while they were there who would end up relapsing. Uh, they would end up getting their kids back. They would get off probation or parole, and they would get uh, promoted in their jobs. And we, fa- we recognized this housing piece is really key. So then we started talking about, right, how could we scale this to a larger level? And um, we had been in conversation with um, some of the people at Panhandle Builders and a um, very reputable, well-known company in our community, and talking with Justin Henry. And um, Justin Henry ac- happened to know someone who owned 72 acres uh, behind the recovery center. And... Um, he said, well, I, my Sunday school teacher, I think, had that land when I was growing up. So he talked to her, and she was willing to sell it to us. And uh, we bought that 72 acres, and then that became the, um, the property on which the village was to be started. Mm-hmm. So it's really been a wonderful evolution of things, you know, with so many community partners like the Wish Foundation, um, this private individual who wanted to offer their land for furthering this cause, and then, um, and then once we got the village going, Senator Capito stepped up and provided some seed money for us um, in some congressional delegate spending to be able to um, uh, start the construction. And, um, and so that's been uh, a real blessing as well. So that's how this has yeah. evolved. Long answer. Sorry for that, Matt. No, but, no um, not at all. It's really been a wonderful process to watch and participate in. Yeah, and and so the construction really began a few years back, uh, 2021, roughly? Uh, we bought the property in December of 2021. Okay. Uh, 2022, uh, we were awarded the funds to start. We, we spent a good amount of time doing the engineering, surveying, mm-hmm. planning, going through the planning commission, working with the county. Um, and then we started construction in, in 2022. And um, then we had a lull in 2023 with um, some um, funds um, being delayed, um, running out of funds, and now we've reacquired some, and then we're now we're able to continue the progress and finish it within target date at the end of this year. So the first folks being able to move into those 48 units those right 48 after the first of the year. Those 48 units should be open around, we're targeting January 1st, so um, hopefully a little bit earlier, right. Uh, but right around there. Uh, so that's what we're looking at doing, and, then, and we're getting really excited about that. You used a, a number a, a few moments ago in your prior answer that just jumped out at me. You said 450 people a year graduating through the program. Were you surprised by that number at all? Um, You know, I really wasn't, um, because when we looked at designing the the facility and we looked at what the numbers were in the state, we thought we'd probably be having about 500 a year Mm -hmm. come through. And so we were right at that. And, um, you know, what what most of us know somebody in our family, loved one, friend who struggled with addiction in some way – but a lot of times we don't realize the size and the and the significance of it as as a as a state as a community, mm-hmm. and um, it's really been it's a huge issue. Um, the housing piece is a huge issue, um, and so we're 
I'm thankful now the resources have been put in place, the treatment centers there, and now this housing piece will be, um, I think, the, um, a big significant missing piece for the community. Do you specifically work with those who are dealing with a drug addiction, um, as we might think of, of drugs as opposed to alcohol, or, or is alcohol considered a drug and, and those who are stuck in an alcohol addiction can find some help there as yeah, well? Yeah, you know, the, um, chemicals have a way of affecting the brain with, with chronic exposure, and then you, you mix in a person's kind of genetics that makes them more predisposed to abuse and become addicted to drugs. Um, Yes, we treat both alcohol and um, a wide range of drugs. Uh, heroin has the most um, publicity because it's been the most lethal. And, of course, that, that's progressed into fentanyl um, being the synthetic form. And that, that's just um, it's, it's so potent that um, many people regretfully will think they're doing something recreationally. Mm-hmm. And um, even something like just smoking marijuana, and they think, well, that's recreational marijuana is okay, and um, don't realize it's laced, and um, and then it's one and done, and um, and so that gets a lot of notoriety because of the lethality. But um, yes, we treat all chemicals that a person might become addicted to. You mentioned also earlier that that number of of folks graduating from the program. What does it take to graduate from the program? And now that the village is is coming together and and will be open, uh, does someone graduate from the recovery center and then hopefully move into the village? Yeah, the the processes are, are, are separate programs. So um, people, when they finish the recovery center program, which is now operated by Pyramid Healthcare, the organization was getting too big. And part of the delays was I just can continue to develop the village. And so we, um, Pyramid Healthcare, who is a um, larger healthcare organization, came in and they're operating the day-to-day operations of the recovery center. And but the program is the same, and, and, and the processes and the dynamics are the same. And, um, and so people will spend about four weeks there. Um, and it takes that amount of time for a person to, for brain to get used to not having drugs or alcohol in the system and to start to get their mood regulated, um, get their health back, um, get their diets normalized. And, um, and then when they finish, many of them don't have uh, jobs or a housing situation, then they would apply to the village. And um, we would look at them on a needs uh, case-by-case basis and, um, and then it, um, bring them into the village as a separate program, uh, which will be they'll be able to stay there from six to nine months will be the average length of stay in the village. Dr. Jonathan Hartian is our guest here on the program. The Mountaineer Recovery Village is having an open house. And those hours again tomorrow, Dr. Hartians? Yeah, it's going to be a good day. We're excited about it, um, uh, inviting the community to come see it. And, um, and, um, and then as a, a preface to the uh, golf tournament, when I get excited about that, September is Recovery Awareness Month. And so uh, the golf tournament is one of the many events in the community to highlight that. If I stay uh, at the, the, the village uh, for six months or, or what have you, uh, who picks up the cost of that? Is that done through insurance, the state, grants? How does it work if I have no money? Yeah, that's what makes the village model unique is it's a self-sustaining model. We won't be dependent upon um, state funds, insurance. The idea is to empower the individual to become responsible for themselves. Um, so insurance may pay for their treatment in the recovery center or wherever they go for treatment. But when they come into the, um, to the village, depending upon their circumstances, there may be some funds to cover the first two months while they're there. Uh, While they get a job, they get a cash flow, our house managers will help them with budgeting, planning, and then um, starting to pay their their house fees for living there and then um, getting them ready so that then they can move on and they will, when they do move on, they will be used to have been paying their rent, paying all their other bills, paying their cell phone or car or whatever. And uh, managing money is, is just like, you know, that's, that's a life skill we kind of all need, and some of mm-hmm. us are, are better at it than others. And so the coaching will be there on site to help them with that. If you go through that and in six to nine months, 
uh, you graduate, you've moved on, you have your own home or whatever, a couple years down the line, relapse. Can you go through a second time? Can you do a second cycle? Yeah, that, that, that's the, um, you know, of course, we, that, that's never a desired option. But if somebody does do that, yes, they can go back through the pipeline. Very good. As far as services maybe beyond that, are, are so someone has gone through the program, through the village, they are now out on their own. Is there still some contact for a period of time yeah, to just absolutely. say, hey, how you doing? And Yeah, you know, just like, like diabetes or, or, or heart condition, um, you know, addiction is treated as a disease that is a, a lifelong condition. Not that a person is going to always struggle, but they always will need the support or just monitoring and follow up. And so, yes, they, the, the ongoing support will be indefinite. Um, it may be spaced out, you know, once every three months, once every six months. Um, but yes, the in intention is that that follow-up would be ongoing. And the biggest thing that people do to stay linked in is then they come back and they help mentor or coach somebody mm -hmm. who's just starting out in the process. And, um, you know, there's a saying in the Recovery Fellowship, the best way to keep your recovery is to give it away. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when people come and serve and then they help others, it really reinforces their own recovery. And what an encouragement to that one that's going through it to have someone who's been there, um, you know, be walking alongside of them, letting oh, them know, hey, yeah. you, can, you, yeah. you can do this too. Yeah, you know, the first question when I get with somebody who who's, I work with is they ask me, are you in recovery? And uh, I'm not in recovery, but I've been taught a great deal mm -hmm. by all the thousands of people that I've worked with. But someone who walks in that's got 10 years of recovery, they got instant credibility, mm -hmm. you know, because they've walked the walk. And uh, they, they know firsthand those experiences. So, yeah, there's nothing like a person uh, to coach them who's been in the trenches. What, what is it that's drawn you to to? be a, a help in this particular area in people's lives and i have about one minute left yeah. for your answer by the way okay so uh yeah just real quickly you know i guess um it was somewhat providential i i didn't know i was going to end up in this field mm -hmm. but um, now as i look back i see i got drawn into it because my own father suffered with alcoholism mm -hmm. um my mom after uh, many years of, of abuse and watching his alcoholism um finally kicked him out when when I was 13 and I, and I remember still very vividly that day and um, saying to myself I will make sure that never happens to my family mm -hmm. um, so I recognized that um, I knew um, as I went through school that I had the all the predispositions for addiction if I allowed myself to be exposed and um, and then was kind of led into a pathway that uh, enabled me to help others and uh, so I think that's f the truth for so many people is that the pain of their past becomes the source of their passion. Dr. Hardians, what time is the open house tomorrow? 11 to 2, right out on Van Meter Road in, in Kearneysville. Very good. All the best to you, and congratulations on the success of the village. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you with us, Dr. Jonathan Hartians. And